Well, we started a book in the book of Revelation last week, and I laid the foundation last week. The entire first chapter really gives us uh, what the book of Revelation is about. And the, the message last week was the title of the message, was also the theme of the book, and here it is, it's all about Jesus. You see, if you don't get that foundation, you're going to get sidetracked in the book of Revelation. Can we admit that there are some things in the book of Revelation that are a little bit strange? You talk about beasts and false prophets and locusts and what, how else would a person in the first century, nearly 2,000 years ago, describe probably what could be described as a catastrophic war with all of the military advancements and airplanes and bombs, and they wouldn't know how to describe it other than the way that it was. And so, in the book of Revelation, if we don't, if we're not careful, we will miss the point you see, the book of Revelation was written to a group of Christians, and these people were being persecuted for their faith, and it was written as an encouragement. In fact, in chapter 1, it does tell us that those who read and hear are going to be blessed. Now, you say, well, it seems like there's a whole lot of judgment going on. How can that be a blessing? Well, just understand, when you understand that you are being oppressed by a false government or a evil government or false religion or things that are not just, and you discover that Jesus Christ is just, that he wins, and that everything that is against you that is not God's will or not good, that God is going to work out and overcome for your good, that would be an encouragement even if you're in the midst of persecution. And so the point of the book of Revelation is simply to remind us that it's all about Jesus Christ, that he wins. He's worthy of our worship. He overcomes death. He overcomes the grave. And that one day we're going to have a resurrected body and we are going to enter into eternity for all of eternity to experience the love and the grace that God wants to pour out on us for all of eternity. That is encouraging. And so today we're going to uh, talk about uh, a church and, and understand that this letter was written by John and uh, John the Apostle. He was one of Jesus' disciples. He also wrote the Gospel of John and he wrote the, the little letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And one of the themes that carries through all of the books that he wrote in the New Testament is the theme of love, that God loves you. And this is very important that we understand that if we're going to interpret the book of Revelation the right way, we must see it through that lens, that God has a plan for your life, that God loves you, he has a better future plan for you. One day justice will come. One day he will rule and reign with all authority and all righteousness and all justice. And we have a lot to look forward to, do we not? And so I hope you will uh, experience this book as we talk about this. But in this book, he wrote it to real churches. And you'll find these real churches, there are seven of them, and uh, they were real churches in what we would call today, it would be modern day Turkey. It was Asia Minor, and it kind of, he goes uh, beginning with Ephesus, uh, and he ends with Laodicea, and it was the it was the way that the, the mail would have been delivered in those cities. He started with Ephesus, the first city, and kind of goes around. And so it's very important that you understand that in this church that he's talking to, it was a very significant church, the church at Ephesus. And in this challenge that Jesus gives to this church, he says, you've lost your first love. Now, what does it mean to be able to return to your first love? What does it mean to fan the flame of your passion for Jesus Christ? If you've been a Christian for very long, you know that it's easy to lose your passion. I mean, when you first get saved, especially if you're an adult, when you get saved, man, everything is new. You're all excited. You can't wait to tell everybody what's going on in your life. And you don't know everything yet, but you sure are excited about the things that God is doing in your life. But after a while, just like in marriage, after a while, 
you tend to cool off a little bit. We all do that, right? Life happens. We get busy. Um, things just simply happen. And so we have to, just in, in our marriage relationships, or our personal relationships, we have to fan the flame. We have to work at staying in love. I remember the first time that I really felt like I was in love with Kim. Kim and I have been married for 36 years. We started dating 40 years ago. And our first foray into the dating world, um, we were at both in a ministry group that traveled all over the country. We were freshmen in college. And our bus broke down. We traveled, we were in Florida, and we traveled all the way uh, up the eastern seaboard, up to Maine and all these different churches. And uh, we broke down in the mountains of Virginia. And we were at a hotel. Notice I did, uh, I'm sorry, a motel, not a hotel. You know, motel's got the doors that you, you know, that just separate you from a few free feet from a serial killer out in the parking lot, right? <laughs> and I kissed Kim for the very first time at a motel in Virginia. Now get your mind out of the gutter. Okay, we just kissed, all right? But I remember that feeling and I was like, you know what? I definitely want to do this again. And I, I really, at that moment, I began to know that this was a woman that I was falling in love with. And we dated for four years, and then we got married, and, and God's blessed us with 36 years, and I still like to kiss her. You, you, can, you can clap at that. I'm not sure if she likes to kiss me or not, but I do definitely like to kiss her. Now, over those 36 years, if you count the dating time, 40 years that we've been together, there have been times that it's been more passionate than others. And if you've been married for a minute, you know what I'm talking about. But in order for us to be our best, in order for us to stay in love, you know what we gotta do? We gotta fan the flames. We gotta work at it. And so the same is true of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We got to work at it. We got to do at what at the very beginning caused us to fall in love with Jesus to begin with. I want to just encourage you to watch my YouTube videos each week. Uh, we did post a video that deals with the book of Revelation last week. Go to YouTube, type in Stillwater's Church. You can find it. Um, I'll be the boasting videos every week that deal with stuff that I don't talk about on Sunday morning, dealing with the book of Revelation, some things you may find interesting. But let me just remind you about what uh, was happening here in uh, the book of Revelation as Jesus was talking to this church, the church at Ephesus, a real church. Remember that John wrote this because Jesus appeared to him and it was some 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was a letter just like much of the New Testament and it's what we call apocalyptic literature. Now, Jesus literally appeared to John. Okay, and that didn't happen in all the books of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit inspired, just like he did the book of Revelation, but the Holy Spirit inspired men of God and they wrote what God uh, wanted for us today, the word of God, so that we could know God's love, we could figure out how uh, we know Jesus better and how to live for God more. But this book was special in that Jesus himself appeared to John and told him, what to write down, what he saw. And he told him, he said, write down what has been seen, what you see now, and what you see in the future. See, what God did for him was he kind of took him into this place where he could see what would happen. He could see what would happen in the future. And one of the interesting things that he saw, and this was a real church that dealt with real problems, he saw these seven churches. And so the first church that we're going to read about today is the church at Ephesus. It was a real church. Uh, Timothy, uh, a protege of the Apostle Paul, was its pastor. In fact, John was actually a member of that church. And do you know who else was a member of that church? Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is a very, very important church. And listen to what Jesus himself said to this church. Begin reading with me in Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. 
To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. Let me just pause here. This was a problem in the church then and a problem in the church today. There were false teachers. In other words, they taught some other gospel than what Jesus himself taught. Now, do not mistake differing opinions about minor doctrines as things to divide over. That is not what we divide over. There are people that divide, and that's where denominations come from. They divide over minor things. But the major thing is that we keep Jesus Christ at the forefront of all we do. And the gospel is centered. And so they were facing this problem as well. He says, they call themselves apostles and are found uh, them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now he uses this word twice. These are the words of Jesus. We know that repent does not mean to turn from your sin. That's self-effort. The word repent means to change your mind. It means to think the way that God thinks. It means to agree with God, to agree with Jesus. And what God wants us to do is to agree with him on how we are to live our life, on how he loves us, on the grace of God. We're to find ourselves in agreement with him. He said, so repent. And uh, he said, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, let me just explain a couple of words, and I want to just give you three thoughts from this passage on how you and I can recover, rekindle, and fan the flame of our love for Jesus Christ. No matter where you are in that relationship with him, you can always do more. You can always be closer to him. Once again, we're not basing our uh, relationship with God on our self-effort. That's the opposite of the gospel. It is that God provided a way for us to be made right with God through the works of Jesus Christ and the finished work of his grace on the cross for us. And it is through focusing on that, it is through faith in Jesus that we find ourselves closer to him. And so how do we fan the flame of our love for Jesus. Well, just a couple of words we wanted to find. The word angel, when you see it uh, in, in these letters to the seven churches, the angel to the ch at the church, and he calls their name. That Greek word is angelos, and it simply means members, uh, uh, or, or messenger rather. It means to be a messenger for God. So to the messenger. Now, who is that? Well, most scholars believe uh, that that is referring to the pastor of the church. So I have a biblical reason for you to call me an angel, all right? So um, look, the fact is that word angel simply means to be a messenger. And I have been chosen by God to be a messenger for the church of Jesus Christ. I am to give the message of the gospel, to give the message and the teaching of the word of God. And then the word star, this also refers to the pastor of a church. Now, before you think that he's trying to inflate the ego of pastors, let me read to you um, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels. In other words, the pastors uh, of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, why is this important? Why do you need to remember this? Well, first of all, the message uh, from the messenger is the key. The job of the messenger or the pastor of the church is really twofold. It is to teach you the message of the word of God. 
It is to point you to Jesus Christ and it is to lead us together as a church to go the direction that God wants us to go. That's the messenger's job. And then the lampstand is the one, of course, that's talking about the church. That's the members of the church. Now, those stars, the reason that's important, listen to what Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 says. Those who are wise will shine like the, the, as bright as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. And once again, leading people to righteousness or the righteous one is simply pointing people to Jesus. And so in essence, what Jesus tells us is this. It is a pastor's job to faithfully teach the word of God and lead the church. It is the member's job to faithfully hear the word of God and to follow uh, the mission that Jesus has laid out for the church. And he wants us to have passion for Jesus Christ in our life. So what does that mean? Well, um, it means that our job is to live our lives around the gospel and to make it all about Jesus and to make sure that we reflect the light of Jesus Christ um, uh, to this world. So the implication is clear. God holds us responsible for this light. So how do you rekindle your love for Jesus? How do you fan the flame of your passion for Jesus Christ? Well, it's found right here in this text. The first word is this. It's the word remember. Remember. Jesus said, remember where you came from. Remember what I did for you. In just a moment, we're going to be taking communion. We are going to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. It is very important that we remember. The Bible is filled with admonitions to remember But remembering in the Bible is not just to recall to memory, but rather it is to put at front and center in your life. It is to prioritize. When you remember something, you're not just having good nostalgic feelings, but rather you are reordering your life. You are reordering your world. You're reordering your public world, your public life, your private world, and your private life. You are reordering it around Jesus Christ. It's very important that we remember. If you're going to rekindle your love, you got to return to doing what made you fall in love in the first place. When Kim and I fell in love, I remember the things that caused me to fall in love with her. I love talking to her. Now, I'm not the most talkative person in the world. I know that probably sounds ironic because I'm a pastor and I do a lot of talking. You like, some of you like, well, you should talk a little bit less on Sunday mornings, right? But, When it comes to just being in groups or whatever, I'm not nearly as talkative as my wife is. She's very outgoing, never met a stranger. Uh, But I remember, man, breaking out of my comfort zone and I loved talking to Kim. Still love to talk to Kim. Not only did I uh, love talking with her, but I loved spending time with her. I loved listening to music with her. Now, I'm not normally the person that listens to music like some people. Some people, every part of their life is about music. I listen to talk radio a lot more than I do music. But I remember that when I was dating Kim, there were a lot of things that I did that I normally didn't do. I listened to a lot more music when I was dating Kim. And I remember uh, going to a classical music concert with her. And I loved pretending to like that music a little bit. (laughs) Got to be honest, didn't really care for it too much. Um, You know, I actually have been to classical music concerts with Kim. And it didn't end there. Uh, Just a couple years ago, uh, she wanted to go to a ballet. Now, I don't know much about ballet, I do know that in this particular ballet, there was supposed to be lots, lots of fighting. And the way they fought is they got up on their toes and danced around a lot. And I just kept asking her, what are they doing now? You know, she's like, well, they're fighting now. I said, it looks like they're dancing to me. What, what is my point? The point is because I loved being with her, I loved doing what she liked to do. 
And it's the same in our relationship with Jesus Christ. You want to rekindle your love for Jesus Christ? Love what Jesus loves. Do you know what Jesus loves more than anything else in the world? He loves people. And, and the more that we love people, the more our passion for Jesus will grow. You know what I did when, uh, not only then, but now, and it keeps me in love with Kim. I just rehearse all the good things about her. I love telling people how kind she is, how wonderful she is. Now, are there times that she aggravates me? Absolutely. We've been married 36 years. I'm not going to pretend that both of us have always uh, seen eye to eye on everything. We haven't. But you know what keeps us in love? We keep doing what made us fall in love to begin with. And I got to tell you today, if you're going to remember what it felt like, what it what you did when you first fell in love with Jesus, there are a couple things you need to do. Number one, uh, write down the word, word, the word of God. You have to spend time talking to him in the Bible and praying. You want to fall in love with Jesus again? Fall in love with reading the word of God and praying. It'll keep you in love with him. Uh, the second word is the word worship. You want to stay hot for Jesus Christ? Then worship him. I realize that not everybody worships the same. Uh, music is a wonderful medium, but that's not the only way to worship him. Um, you can worship him with your work. You can worship him with something that you create. You can worship him out in nature. Find what causes your heart to connect with God and do that on a regular basis. Get in the word of God and read the Bible and pray and worship him. Maybe you like to play music and that causes you to worship. Maybe you like going out into the woods and that causes you to worship. Uh, maybe you like to go to the beach. That causes you to worship. Find whatever it is and worship God. And then you need to witness. That's the third word I want you to write down. You see, the crux of what Jesus had against this church at Ephesus, you know what it was? That they had stopped being light. They were faithful to the word of God. He said, man, you, you, have, you have really been good. You've really um, been the kind of, of church that is faithful to truth, but you've lost your love. And you know, there's nothing sadder than a church that has got a lot of truth, but not a lot of love. Do you know what comes out of churches like that? People that, what I call rock throwers, all they want to do is Christians, they don't want to light a light. They want to curse the darkness. You know what? It's easy to curse the darkness, isn't it? I mean, all around us today, there's all kinds of things to curse about. But you know what God wants the church to do? To fall in love with Jesus and to be a witness because you light a light, not because you curse the darkness. And so this is what God challenges us to do if we want to rekindle our heart's passion for Jesus. Here's a second word I want you to write down, the word repent. God calls us to repent, and I think to repent regularly. Now, what does the word repent mean? Well, I've already told you, it means to agree with God. It means to realign your thinking. You see, whenever you begin to agree with God and you begin to realign your thinking based on the truth of the word of God, then you're going to become a light to the world. You're going to do what God called that church to do, which is to be light. Let me read to you a couple of passages. Uh, John chapter one, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we know this as the love chapter. Listen to the first three verses. If I could speak the, all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm afraid there are a lot of Christians. You know what they are in this world? They're just a bunch of noise. They don't make a difference. They aggravate people with noise. Don't be that. Then he goes on. He said, if I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. He's saying that the church, the Christian that separates itself from love is just a bunch of noise. It doesn't really accomplish much. 
Oh, you can be committed to truth and you should be. And as long as I'm the pastor of this church, we are going to seek to be a church that is rooted in the word of God, the truth of God's word. But if we don't have love, what point does it make? You're just preaching to the choir and no more. You'll never make a difference in this culture. He said, if I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. We must be a place of grace and truth. God says we're to remember, if we want to be in love with him, we're to remember what caused us to fall in love in the first place. We're to read the word of God and pray and we're to worship God. We are to have our hearts stirred by being around other Christians. We are to be that light for others. And then we're to repent. repent. We're to do that constantly, repeatedly. That's not just something you do when you get on your knees before you get in bed at night. And I've heard a lot of Christians do this and I've done this myself in the past. It's not really biblical, but here's what we do. Lord, if I've done any, if I've sinned today, please forgive me of all my sins. Well, I guess there's nothing wrong with praying to be forgiven for something maybe that you didn't know that you did. But you know what's so much better? It's to say, God, forgive me from cussing my wife out today because I know that wasn't like Christ. Uh, God, forgive, him, forgive me for treating that person that I work with today like crap because uh, I don't like her and I, I'm just sorry that I acted the way that I did, Lord. God, forgive me from losing my patience with my children today. Wait, that's not a sin. Never mind, never mind. If you got kids. <laughs> People that don't have children, they look at parents that will yell at their kids occasionally and they're like, oh, they're shocked at that. I just say, it's because you don't have kids. Don't worry about it. One day you'll yell at kids just like everybody else, all right? So, look, the truth is that God has called us to be light. And what he warned this church of was this. If they failed to get that passion back, that he said, I'm going to remove your lampstand. You know what that means? He's going to remove their influence. He's going to remove their influence in the community around them so that they're not going to really fulfill the very purpose of a church, which is to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. It is to be a community of believers that comes together and corporately encourages one another and corporately hears the word of God taught and, and, and uh, turns their heart toward Jesus Christ. And they live in passion. They live in community with one another and as a result of their life change, they are light in the community. There's nothing worse than an irrelevant church, than an irrelevant Christian. Because what happens to people like that and to churches like that, they become holier than thou and they don't help reflect the light of the gospel. They don't help spread the gospel they actually hinder. And so God said, Jesus said, remember, repent. And then I love how Jesus ended. He reminded them of their reward. Now I want you to notice, and this is actually a pattern you're gonna notice over the next few weeks as we talk about these different churches. Next week I'm gonna talk about what do you do when life doesn't turn out like you expect? The church we're going to talk about next week, there were some things that happened to them and they were not expecting it. And so we're going to talk about that next week. Don't miss it. But I love what Jesus did here. He commended every one of these churches for something good that they did. Then he corrected them and then he taught them how to love them and encouraged them by showing them the benefits of living for him. Now notice that little pattern. He commended. You know, we need to be more aware that God loves us, that Jesus loves you, that there are some things about you that he thought were so valuable that he died on the cross for you. Sometimes we forget that. He commends some things about us, but then he corrects us. You see, he loves us too much to leave us like we are. Because, you know, if, you're, if we're honest, we all have problems, right? We all have shortcomings. We all have failures. 
And Jesus corrects that. But then he also shows them how they can correct it. In other words, he doesn't leave you without answers. He lets you know how to get better. And through reflection and repentance, he calls us to a better life. And then he reminds us that when we do these things, there's going to be a reward. Man, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Can you see the grace that is in that? There are some Christians that believe that God is the angry guy in the sky with a big stick waiting for you to step out of line so he can whack you upside the head. But that's not who God is. Does God have anger? Yes. Does God have righteous judgment? Yes. But you know what he did? He poured out that anger. He poured out that righteous judgment on Jesus Christ. And because of that, when you receive him by faith, you are no longer the recipient of his wrath, but you are the recipient of his grace. And I'm so glad. You said, well, I didn't really deserve that. That's why it's called grace. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. You don't merit it. It is freely given by God. And that grace is seen in how Jesus deals with each of these churches. He says, there are some things I love about you. He said, there's some things you need to correct. Here's how to correct them. And oh, by the way, there's going to be a reward one day if you'll stay faithful. Well, he, he says, as we close, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Now, if you'll notice that at the end of each of these commendations and corrections that Jesus gives to the churches, he reminds them of some things that will happen in eternity. He reminds them of some things that are going to happen, but it's not just in eternity, but it's also in life now. You see, in eternity, we're going to be granted to eat of the tree of life. In other words, we're going to have eternal life. We're going to be eternally blessed the Bible says at the end of the book of Revelation that Jesus will wipe away all tears from our eyes. There's not going to be any more sorrow, no more pain. Man, it's going to be a wonderful day. And he talks about the paradise of God. In other words, this is where God lives. And the definition of heaven is the abode of God. We are going to live with God. Actually, more accurately, God is going to live with us. That's incredible. But there's a twofold promise here that I want you to see. It, it does not show a works-based salvation, but rather what it shows us is that God will bless us in eternity, but he will also bless us now. You see, the promise here is the assurance or the confidence of our salvation. Wouldn't it be great if you could have confidence in your Christian life? Oh, I'm not talking about the confidence to get up in front of a group of people and uh, speak publicly if that's something that you're afraid of. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about walking around puffed up and saying, boy, I'm so confident that I can beat anybody at the game of basketball. I don't, I don't mean that. But wouldn't it be great if your confidence was built in trusting God? When life throws you a curveball, it doesn't knock you off course. You know why? You've got confidence. Your faith in Jesus is strong. When your kids have problems, you don't get knocked off course. You know why? Because your confidence is strong in Jesus Christ. You know God promises if you'll do what he said, if you'll remember, you'll worship him, read the word of God, uh, pray, you'll, uh, you'll be a witness in this world, you reflect light, if you'll repent, agree with God. He says, you know what's gonna be your reward? He's gonna build your confidence. You're going to get stronger in your faith. And then the other part of the promise was the life-giving presence of God. I got to tell you, I've been a pastor for a long time now. And I've dealt with lots of people that had illness. Lots of people that had problems. Lots of people that had life throw something at them that they never expected. I've even dealt with lots of people that were nearing death's door. And you know what is amazing to me? Is that those Christians that have that life-giving presence of God with them in those moments, I can't tell you how amazing that is. And in the first church I pastored, there was a dear old lady, and, and I call her old because she was very old. All right, so... 
Uh, that's not a disrespectful term, but she had been around a long time. And I remember she was getting close to death's door. The doctors had said she wasn't going to live very long. And I, I went by to visit her. And I remember I was just a young pastor. I was maybe close to 30. And I remember going over there to do my pastoral duty. And I was going to pray with her. And I was going to encourage her and build her up. And I remember going in and sitting with this dear old Christian woman. She had lived a wonderful life. She was nearing the time that she was going to go home with Jesus. <laughs> and I remember looking at her and calling her name and saying, I just want you to know it's going to be okay. Jesus is with you. And I thought she was going to turn me over her knee and spank me. She looked at me. She said, son. Of course it's going to be okay. And of course I'm looking forward to being with Jesus. And she looked at me and she said, because God is with me and soon I'm going to be with him. And I remember leaving that day thinking, you know, I came here to encourage her and she actually encouraged me. You know what that is? That's the life-giving presence and power of God. You can have that in your life as well. That's what Jesus promised us. Today as we wrap up the service, I want us to end the sermon part with communion. You see, one of the things that God has challenged us to do is to remember. We're to remember that Jesus loves us. We're to remember what God has done for us. And I'm going to have prayer and we have on both sides here at the front of the auditorium. We're going to ask you to, after I pray, we're going to have some music and uh, you come and get the elements and you can have prayer here. You can go back to your seat and pray. Uh, you can pray with friends, but we want to give you a moment to reflect, to remember what Jesus has done for you. Let's everyone stand together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us during this time to remember your love, your grace, your amazing salvation. We thank you that the bread represents the body of Jesus. We are able to be delivered. You are our provision. You are the one who heals us and that the juice represents the absolute salvation that comes from Jesus Christ and from Christ alone. God, we thank you for that today and help us today to remember what you've done as we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.